Give me a sec, folks. Just sorting out a problem. I think I've solved it. I don't know why, but my router does some strange stuff. Right, folks. Let me get my mics on. Apologies for my late start, but um, my router was misbehaving again. Sometimes when it gets reset, it just seems to throw a wobbler and go into this daft loop. Right. But anyhow, I am here now. How is everyone? A little flustered. And I need a damn haircut. But that's not going to happen for ages yet. Hope everyone's had a good few days. When did I stream last? Was it Friday? Oh dear. Please let yourself be heard. Make yourself known on the chat, folks. Um, let me also, whilst I'm here, just dig out stuff that we may wish to cover. Hmm. Poor old FPGA account has just just worked out what it's like to install the Xilinx tools, or is in the process of doing so. <laughs> Bit of a shock after coming from Ice Storm and Symbiosis and stuff, or Symbiflow rather. Right, uh, I was going to just have a quick look. There were a few little items of interest I wanted to just mention. Um, Looks like Gatecat's getting on with the uh, Nexus port for Project Oxide. See him tweet about it here. Project Oxide is um, Gatecat's uh, support. I mean, basically, um, it's covering the next, the Lattice Nexus family. Now, Lattice Nexus family cover is the, the silicon inside, it's the new silicon, um, and it's the Crosslink NX is one of the family, and I think the other one is Cerberus, uh, few of which are really shipping. I mean, the, the Crosslink ship first, but it's just almost impossible to get stock at the moment. It's um, been a very poor launch by Lattice. But anyhow... Um, it has been working on getting that over um, with Project Oxide, which is very cool. <clears throat> and he's made some good progress on that. So I, I noticed that he'd um, tweeted about that. So do check that out. I'd very much like to use um, one of the Nexus family for a uh, low power FPGA board. But it's kind of pointless at the moment if you can't get any stock. So, uh, I'm in no hurry to do that. Um, so I might do an in-betweeny board. That's the 
current plan, you know, a, a medium power or low to medium power rather than a ultra low power board. It will kind of get me there anyhow in the long term because um, there's some commonality. Um, hi there, Laurie. I've got my tea, which is good. My Wednesday night um, streaming tea. What else did I see? Um, anything else interesting? Yeah, FPGA Kian is moving on to the RTA7 board. I'm sure that's going to be fun. He's just been doing some work on. Yeah, this was quite interesting. I'm, I'm not familiar with this. Um, these polynormals, but. Apparently, it's quite fun to work on. So he's been porting these polynormal polynormals that he found a research paper on. A bit of FPGA math. Um, BCH and multipliers and stuff like that, which is kind of interesting. The video is very flashy. Let me show you that on the screen. Got the uh, CAD view. Turn my browser on, if possible. And you can see here. Yeah. Very, very flashy. Yeah, he's been torturing various pieces of logic using NextP and R to build these uh, adders and multipliers, a bunch of them concurrently, in order to do this BCH stuff. I don't think the code's particularly uh, complex, it's just he's using generate to make many copies of them. I think he did do a, yeah, he shows the uh, the mapping using XBNR graphical user interface here. An interesting thread. So what else did we have of any interest in the FPGA world? Oh yeah, I watched this last night actually. Peter was working on the uh, memory. Um, they don't. What does he call it? It's like a little internal daughter card rather than the external connectors for Glasgow. It's this, um, basically, it's a pair of Winbond Hyperflash chips that he's putting on the LVDS connector of Glasgow to give the um, HX8. Some good, uh, um, a nice big chunk of memory. So it's kind of cool. He had to fit it in this tiny space that he had left in the case here. You can see. In order to do that, he's had to use a very low profile connector. Um, and even the board that he's just made up, he did it in the stream last night. The whole thing fits in there, but it leaves like a half a mil gap in the case because it actually hits the top. In order for this to, to work properly, he's going to have to use a, you know, like a one mil rather than a 1.6 mil thickness PCB just to get it fit in, just to make it fit in there. Very tight fit. So it's kind of cool. It's been an interesting couple of streams that he's done um, that I've been following. He's been doing that. Very nice. He hasn't done the gateway for it yet, uh, although um, Sylvan has produced some gateway for that. It's just a case of uh, him getting it to work on Glasgow. 
yeah, Martin started using the FPGA. He's actually joined the um, Black Ice Forum as well. I mentioned. Um, anyone else got any news items that we need to cover? Oh, Olaf Kindren was interviewed by Matthew Venn. Uh, he, they published that um, that interview, which is kind of cool. I don't know when they're going to publish my one. But Matthew did. We'll see. Um, so one of the conversations we were having um, last week around uh, black crap in particular, um, let me just switch my view here, um, was that we were thinking about how we were going to do the communication from the host. Uh, PC or laptop, whatever it is, it's connected to, say, the amalgam. Uh, the amalgam and the uh, low-powered board we do for robotics might be slightly different in this sense. I don't know how much commonality they'd share. But one of the things we were thinking about was perhaps laying something over the simple serial connection so that it could do... Um, better range of um, or provide a better range of tooling than it currently does on say Black Eyes MX um, so we were looking at wrapping the serial in something uh, and UDP was one of the possibilities you know just simple datagram stuff enabled us to send from certain addresses or identities to other addresses and or identities uh, and that's very interesting as a possible um, today or the last few days however I've been looking around at um, the different possibilities so I think it's definitely worth having a little discussion about this and understanding um, and I'm kind of moving towards having the serial, sorry, having the USB uh, come up as a storage device. Um, the more of the new uh, software or firmware and things that I see being used in the um, um, open hardware arena. We're seeing these um, mounting uh, storage spaces on cards more and more frequently. And I'm wondering whether that is a better way to go primarily. Now, I should explain my thinking here because One of the problems that you have, if you make a board uh, that is designed for development, right, which is what we're talking about here, uh, something like the Amalgam board will be for developers primarily. I mean, it may get used because because it will be a systems on a module type. Right? It could be used in applications directly. Uh, but at least initially, before it becomes used directly in an application, it will be used for development. Um, one of the big problems you have is getting the various pieces of software installed and also being able to connect to it. It can cause you endless problems. And one of the big problems, uh, or one of the big uh, areas where you have problems, is in getting the two to talk to each other. 
because you need to be able to have it operate. I seem to have a mark on my glasses here. It's really me up. Um, having it work on different platforms. Now, something that that's uh, what's happened in MicroPython, for example. And one of its big advantages, sorry, in CircuitPython, one of its biggest advantages over MicroPython is they seem to have done the right thing here. And that right thing is having the device come up as a storage device. Why does that work so well? Well, it's, it's fairly... Um, it's a very standard thing. Most operating systems know how to deal with a USB storage device. Um, and you've actually got a lot of flexibility. So if something comes up as a storage device and you need to, you know, change what's running on the board, for example, making that happen can be as simple as copying a file across from your PC to that storage device because that storage just appears an extension to your storage. It comes up, you know, in Windows or Mac OS as another drive or as in Linux as a mount point. And once, you, once, once it's mounted and or accessible from the operating system, it's really just a copy away from wherever you're doing your development. And that has, that, that's a really simple way of uh, people getting started because they don't have to do anything special. So they get the board, they take it out of the bag or box or whatever. They plug the USB cable in one end and then the USB into their laptop you know, ding dong, and it comes up as a storage device, and straight away they can copy, you know, the thing they want to run on it across. It's such a simple interface. They don't have to know how to deal with, you know, uh, serial communications, for example. So if you're on Windows, you could go and use Windows Subsystem for Linux. Well, most people can't, don't, aren't familiar with that unless they've come from a Linux background. Um, so then they'd have to install something like a terminal program. So Windows doesn't come with a terminal program anymore. So you'd have to put on, you know, putty or something similar in order just to be able to talk, talk serial to the device. So you're already putting hurdles in the way. Um, But with the storage, it's, it's there straight away. So I think, you know, as a kind of what you put on first, I think maybe using the uh, USB as a storage device as a primary means, as the first thing that users see. Is probably a good way to go. I don't know what your thoughts on that. What are your thoughts on that, Laurie? Hopefully these are clean now. You can actually see through them marvellously. That's good. Says, it didn't work too well the way that Pico did it. Um, are you talking? What are you talking about? Are you talking about? Are you talking about their MicroPython, the way that you have to use Forney or whatever, or are you talking about? Something else. Hold on, my browser's just complaining. P 
shaming of that plugin. But this is mainly due to the lack of the reset button. Which, which issue are you talking about? Are you talking about the issue of running Python? Or are you talking about um, I'm just trying to remember because it was a while ago since I did my board from Pico. I mean, when you plug it in, it comes up as a drive, doesn't it? And then you copy across a binary that you download off um, the Raspberry Pi site. Now, in my case, I'm trying to remember what it was actually. I think I downloaded the first. No, the first thing I downloaded, I think, was um, was it Circuit Python or was it? Michael Python, I can't remember. It was one of those two. And after you do that, I think it's meant to, is it meant to reset itself? Or are you meant to unplug it and then plug it? I can't remember actually what the order of things was. I mean, my modus operandi wasn't going to be exactly like the Pico. It was going to be a bit more like CircuitPython. Um, Laurie's saying, but reprogramming and getting the drive back needs unplugging. Yeah. Yeah, in my case, I'm thinking of being a bit bit smarter about it than that I don't know quite why they went like that um, um, I'm thinking a bit more like circuit Python in many senses I mean there are different options at this point without the reset button what I'm thinking here is you can copy the binary, say, I mean, hmm, this is where it's difficult because there's different levels. Let's think about from the point of view of programming the FPGA, the simplest case, right? So the user gets the board, they plug it in, it comes up as a drive, they've got an example that they've downloaded called, say, Blinky, a binary, and they copy that. You know, maybe it's called FPGA.bin, right? And as soon as you copy that, then FPGA.bin is programmed into the FPGA and it is the synthesis is running, the implementation is running. That's the simplest case. There's no reset button involved in that particular instance, right? I'm trying to think if that's probably the most common case as well. I know we have more complex cases and we'll move up to them. But yeah, you wouldn't need a reset button for that. In other words, what would what I think should happen is it should be like circuit Python in that sense. You know, whatever's running on the STM32 is looking at the file system. Well, it's not actually looking at the file system um, because all the file system is is a software representation of what's in the flash. And everything that goes into the flash, it, that happens through the STM32. So the STM32 knows what's going on. So if you put an FPGA.bin file in there, it knows that it, not only does it have to store it in the flash, but that it needs to operate that. So in other words, it needs to program the flash with that binary. But it itself doesn't need to restart. I mean, it will restart the FPGA, obviously, because you'd have to do that if you were programming the FPGA. But you wouldn't need a reset button in that case, right?
I mean, obviously, this is the simplest case. That's just running something on the FPGA. You know, a more complex situation might be maybe you were putting a special kind of file up. Yeah, now maybe there's two binaries. Maybe there's a binary for the FPGA and then there's a binary for the STM32. Right. In this case, what should happen? Well, obviously, the binary for the FPGA will need to be loaded into the FPGA. That's the same as before. But what what does the STM32 do? Well, ideally, it runs what you've just uploaded as an app. That's kind of in my head. That's the way it should work. So there's some sort of dynamic loading part to it, I guess. So there's a there's something in the flash that stays resident unless it's put into a DFU mode. And the stuff that's in there is like a bootloader of sorts, right? But it recognizes when an FPGA binary image is uploaded and reprograms the FPGA, but it's also capable of jumping or loading to uh, a program that it realizes it needs to run. That's kind of the way I'm thinking about it. Doing that, of course, is slightly different. So what I'm not saying is that it reboots itself. Although underneath it may do something, something like that, I guess. But... You want to try and avoid using losing certain parts of the system. Certain parts of the system I'd like to keep running. It's almost like having a basic operating system on there that's capable of keeping things like the communication running, right? Managing the flash, keeping the communications running. So that your disk drive doesn't disappear and then come back up. Although you know, you could get that route. I don't know if that's the best way of doing it. You know, I think any any software that was developed for the STM32 would need to always provide a certain level of operation like handling the USB and the flash, right? So you, that you didn't lose that functionality. Now, it may be that it has to restart, in which case the driver will disappear and come back up. A bit more awkward. Or there may be a way of doing it more dynamically, but that's... Complicated and will depend on the memory arrangements, among other things. Because then you're talking about dynamically loading programs, aren't you? But they're compiled programs. You said, yeah, does Rust support... USB drive devices. Yeah, I've been looking around, going through various different bits of code. There is code out there, certainly, that does this at different levels. Okay, here's another one as well, just to throw into the mix. So there can be another mode as well. 
Now, this other mode is really like a debug mode. And in the debug mode, it will be able to do things like perhaps act as a debugger to a core that's running inside the FPGA. I think that would be a nice mode to have. I think that would be useful. So in this case, what the STM32 could do is load a binary that's provided by it on the file system that's destined for the core that's been synthesized in the FPGA. And then it can use maybe some debug pins to control the FPGA. So the synthesis would have to con have, you know, JTAG or SWD or something similar in that case. Yeah, Litex does support that kind of stuff. That, that's the kind of thing I'm thinking. I mean, not all of these have to come at once, but I think it's capable. We are capable of doing all of these things. Um, and there's quite a bit of code out there. And um, I think we could support things like DAT link and stuff. And then we can possibly, you know, bind different classes to the uh, to the USB, or we use more than one USB on the device. In the amalgam device, we got more than one USB possibly. So, you know, you could have one being used as a storage device, the other is being used as a kind of debug port, maybe. That's a possibility. So, for example, you could have the storage device coming up as per normal, which is used for loading uh, apps, uh, loading the FPGA and loading apps. And then the second USB port is used as a kind of, um, what do they call it, DAP link? which is a mixture of devices. It's got a kind of, um, you can have like a serial and a debug port at the same time. So then it would function in a much more, um, it would provide a lot more base functionality for the operation of the FPGA. As well as being able to run code on the STM32 as well. I'm not sure how we do the dynamic running of that. Um, You'd effectively need to load the application, if you like, in from external flash. But then I don't know how you do, because that tends to use dynamic linking, whether you'd need to restart in order for that to work, or you'd need it to restart itself. In which case you have a, you know, you'd lose the USB devices temporarily, then they come back up. Not quite sure if you could easily do that. Um, but there's certainly options that I'm starting to look into. But I'm thinking uh, storage device first. And then the other bits and pieces second on the amalgam, for example. Yeah, I'm not sure how the Rust 
plugin thing would work because the stuff has to be linked in you know it's low level code it's not done it's not like python it's not interpreted on the fly you have to link stuff in and i think if you have to link stuff in then you theoretically have to reload the entire thing so even though it's in flash it would kind of reset itself and reload itself which may mean that the usb disconnects and then reconnects for example but that's um you know that's i don't think that's hugely inconvenient slightly less convenient than the updating your cfpga you don't need any kind of re reloading of the STM32 firmware. Um, yeah. Anyhow, definitely um, worth thinking about those possibilities. But I am leaning towards a storage device first approach I think that provides the easiest way in for most cases um, one thing that we would have to look at so in the case I mean you'll, you'll be more familiar with this Lauren in the case where you've got some sort of call running on the FPGA, um, you need to load the program for whatever that core is. What is the best way of doing that? Is that is it best to write it into the um, you know, block RAM or SRAM or whatever. For something like an ECP5, for example. OSD is the best method for a lot of applications. So OSD is on screen display, right? A, a user choosing an image to be loaded. But only true if they use a display. Well, the user well the user wouldn't be able to interact with it, but I mean they may be interacting with it from the computer. But yeah, if it was standalone, you'd need some sort of display to enable that functionality. You'd need some sort of firmware loader that was also capable of presenting the options on a you know on a display. And they're usually loading for an ST card. Is that because it's a lot of storage required, Lori? I mean, these things could equally go into Flash, but only you know, if they take up a vast amount of space, then you might not want to do that. Either way, the STM32 has to let the user choose what they want through an OSD and then load it, load it. I don't think the STM32 can easily manipulate the bin files. I have thought about that before. Maybe possible because they sit in certain sections of the file. But that's um, 
That's a tricky ask at this point. Um, so what it would have to do is it would have to provide a loading interface. Now that could be done through a kind of JTAG or it could be done uh, like an SPI slave or something, I guess. So slave on the STM32 side and a um, master on the uh, FPGA side. I don't know what the easiest way of doing that is. Um, or does it prefer like a kind of serial loading, like an asynchronous UART type thing? Software and data and BRAM is limited. Yeah. I don't think we can separately program the SRAM parts. I mean, it may be possible to break the binary down like that because it is in sections, but I wouldn't anticipate that at this point. So I would anticipate some form of um, loading from the FPGA, or the FPGA being a kind of master or receiver of data from the STM32. So the synthesis is programmed into the FPGA that then runs. It then, you know, talks to a specific interface. <coughs> Mm. the retro thing is slightly different from the other applications because in other applications there may be um, a bus element um, that's used to interconnect the two um, I don't know if it'd be easy to use like a some sort of bus wrapper for the retro stuff or whether that makes it more complicated. So you're saying, uh, Laurie's saying here, either via a UART or preferably something faster. Yeah, well, something like SPI is probably faster. I mean, there will be, I mean, we have, we have an FMC interface between the two, but you putting the support for the FMC in, if you're developing an application, you put it in to the FPGA, you build it in as part of the library. But if you're running a retro application, that's rather different. You probably wouldn't want to include all the FMC support in that case. You just want something relatively simple like... Um, a UART or maybe an SPI or something like that. I mean, there is an SPI interface because there's an SPI set of connections between the STM32 and, say, the ECP5 because we need to program it. So there's an SPI interface there. So at that point, um, you know, there could be an SPI transaction or two to move the data across. To the running process. So what's Laurie saying here? Um, Litex solutions effectively extend a wishbone bus to the host, usually over USB. Well, if you had a wishbone bus, in this case, in the case of Amalgam, you could also build an FMC to wishbone. So the STM32 could talk through its memory map. It could memory map the wishbone stuff, if you like.
That's really nice. I think I, my cap was adjusted. I seem to be lower down. Or maybe it's my new chair. Maybe I'm just sloping forward. Um. Yeah, we, I mean, the STM32 could directly access any wishbone bus that's inside. Inside the FPGA. Now, whether you somehow give access to that on the host side or not is a entirely different question I mean you could if you wanted to hello twin cross it's just oh hungry or you just come for some attentions yeah you're gonna say hello no say hello no one giving you any attentions is that what it is Hello. Or do you want to go out? I better check see if she wants to go out. You're not getting any more like your Olympic plus boots. Yeah, <laughs> well, you had chicken this morning. We'll spoil Puss Cat. Well, you do want to go out now, do you? You're like a dog. Oh, not very nice out there. Raining and windy. Right, sorry folks, back again. Saxon Sock uses boot files. In flash. And file system on the SD card. Yeah, well, I'm assuming that all of our stuff can be within the file systems. And that can be a mixture between the flash on the STM32, not the um, internal flash, but the um, uh, external chips. Or if you wanted an SD card, there's an SD card holder on that it's not particularly performant i add but it's it's there for larger storage devices all be them somewhat slower um So on Saxon Sock, does that have a um, does that have a debug interface like a JTAG or SWD or something? Laurie Griffiths was saying on oh, at Hoglet's uh, Black Eye Solutions used boot files on the STM32 flash sent by SPI to the FPGA. And then a file system on the SD card. Yeah, I mean, you can always add a file system to the FPGA anyhow by adding an SD card to it. At this point in time, I don't think I've got enough spare pins to add that in. I mean, it's possible. Because it's fairly, um, fairly easy to do without 
crazily, I've still got fewer pins than I actually wanted. But I can double up on those pins. So that the FPGA has got an SD card, or you can add it, you know, as an add-in card or something. I don't know how big the files are for the rest of the stuff. Are they huge? Is it like lots of small files that add up to a large amount of storage? Doing that over an FM link would be better. You mean the FMC link? Yeah, well, that's the fastest way of doing it. However, there is a side effect in that you need to build support for the FMC link into the synthesis itself. That can be made relatively easy, but it will take up, you know, resources, lookup tables, etc. I mean, yeah, it will be really rapid. You could move the stuff across really quickly. I mean, what you normally what you'd normally do is have the internal memory of the FPGA addressable from the FMC via some sort of bus in the synthesis. Now, if you've already got a bus, maybe if you're if you're doing Saxon sort, you've already got a bus, so you wouldn't want to recreate that bus. In this case, then what you do is you do an FMC to whatever their banana bus or whatever that's called. So the FMC could just be a master on the banana bus. Does it? Do, does the banana bus? Is it banana bus? The Saxon sock? Does that support uh, more than one master? Yeah, if you use SPI, then you need you need an SPI that's capable of being even master or slave needs to reverse its roles but you could do that in software but I mean so if it supports more than one master then the quickest way of getting information to a synthesis on Saxon sock is to include within that synthesis a master a second master second to the processor or processors if there's more cores um, but that processor source would be FMC so in other words, the STM32 would talk over the FMC to a piece of synthesized hardware that converts that to master bus transactions on the internal banana bus or whatever it's called on the Saxon sock. That is the most effective way of doing it. So the bit of synthesis that you'd add in would be the FMC master to banana bus. So for debugging, Saxon Sock usually has an external JTAG device connected to the FPGA pins. Yeah, in this case, what I'm saying is, so say the ideal situation, right? So in the Saxon Sock example, I mean, it's going to be different for different things. The retro thing is definitely going to be different. But for something like the Saxon Sock, ideally, the way that you do it is you'd have an FMC master to banana inside. Then you'd use the S I mean then you'd use the SPI pins that have been used to program the FPGA to actually um, as JTAG pins. So internally in your synthesis, your JTAG input pins in the FP into the FPGA would be the SPI pins, which are connected to the STM32. And then the STM32 then uses the SPI peripheral as a JTAG. Then you'd have debug, plus you'd have the ability to access the, be a master on the internal bus in the FPGA. You'd have the best of both worlds effectively. That would be the ideal setup, I think, for Saxon Sock. 
So that wouldn't, the only new synthesis that that would require, the JTAG staff will be easy because you just map it to the uh, SPI pins. Um, obviously there need to be a JTAG piece of software running on the STM32, but I'm assuming that we can put that in. I don't think that's difficult. I've found, already found examples of that. Um, the new bit will be the FMC to bus master that kind of bus plug-in inside the uh, FPGA as part of your Saxon Sox synthesis that's the, that's the you'd have to write that in my gen or whatever right or very log and pull it into not my gen um Spinal, Spinal HCM, and you'd be able to do a similar thing for Litex, right? That would be mine. It'd have the same model. That's your kind of ideal model because in that scenario, you've got the fastest possible way of exchanging the information between the STM32 and your system on a chip i.e. through the FMC bus, which is hooking into the, you know, as a master into the internal bus, into the solution. Plus you've got debug support, you know, from the STM32 as well, potentially. I guess. Having an FMC master to wishbone would be a good idea generally for solutions that use wishbone. But in the Saxon sock, I'm guessing they use their own, what is it, the banana bus or whatever it is. You'd have to do something more specific for that. You're a bit confused by FMC. It's just an external memory bus. Uh, it's a muxed memory bus. So there's, you know, 27 lines or something, right? 16 of those are purely for data exchange. They're bi-directional and an extra few of them are for the extra addresses. So basically the kind of thing you do is you present the address first that you're talking to and then the data. So in two clock cycles, you could have exchanged a 16 bit word to a specific address. But there's all sorts of other clever modes that enable you to do bursts. So start at an address and then just burst lots of data to successive addresses, for example, or read from successive addresses. FMC is just what STM uses as a label for it. I don't even know what it stands for. It's, it's, it's basically the internal peripheral um, inside STM. Uh, it's called the FMC controller. The FMC, it's like something memory controller. I can't remember what the F stands for. And it supports different memory access standards. So the standards it support vary by depending on which chip you're using. So for example, the interconnect standard that I'd be using for the um, for the STM32 to talk to the FPGA, it would talk to the FPGA as if it was like a, a PS RAM, which is a muxed interface. So it sends the address, then it sends the data on the same pins. Um, but you've also got muxed NOR access, like or NAND flash access, which is very similar. Um, but the FMC itself supports even more. So you can actually go really wide and you can actually talk to SD RAM, but we wouldn't want to use SD RAM interfacing as a connection method. For two reasons. One is you need a heck of a lot of pins between the two devices. And secondly, there are a whole bunch of memory refresh things 
you know pins in there that you don't need with the FPGA right so the best compromise on the particular chips that I'm the particular STM32 chips I'm using is to use like a PS RAM type MUX interface which is this MUX of data and address space with a few control pins basically but it's quite rapid because it's wide you know your data width is 16 bits for each clock cycle um, your address which width varies depending how you set it up but um, you know I'm looking at having something like a 23 bit address width or something like that 22 23 bit address width so it gives me a good amount of indexing into the FPGA itself and to any memory within the FPGA itself but basically what you do is you decode that onto the um, internal bus that you synthesized in it in this case I mean what you could do if you wanted if you was doing it from scratch if it wasn't a system on a chip like the traditional system on a chip in this case it's two systems and basically what it's doing is it's accessing a bunch of peripherals inside the FPGA and the internal memory of the FPGA you know the BRAM and SRAM that may be built into the FPGA and or any memory that's connected to the FPGA in that case you're just effectively extending the FMC address space to include all the peripherals all the memory that that FPGA has access to and of the things that have been synthesized in there in which case you've not even got a core the core is the STM32 that's controlling that bus that's another way of looking at it so that's a, that's a different you know that's one way we're looking at working with it moving forward where you don't have a separate core in the FPGA you don't necessarily need to um, you just have a bunch of registers memory addresses and a bunch of um, how can we put it um, uh, high level synthesized streams streaming hardware <clears throat> that's a different kind of setup to the traditional SOC that doesn't involve a soft core I'm just trying to make sure that we cover all of our bases though really here so for those things that we're already familiar with that are very popular on black ice and stuff that we cover those bases as well as all the new ones uh, Laurie says uh, one issue with the Saxon sock is that Dulu 1990 wouldn't be interested in implementing it so I would need to implement it as a DMA DMA peripheral or bus bridge yeah well you could do it as a bus bridge or a DMA peripheral or you can make it a master I don't know I don't know enough about the bus that you're talking about but it's it's a relatively small investment where you get a lot large return because you're if you can hook it into the bus then it gets access to everything that's on that bus in other words it could me th theoretically memory map everything that's on that bus or it's accessible by that bus um, in it could memory map that into the STM32 which is useful quiet tonight we don't have many viewers probably because I started late probably lost a few um, we move, we'll move on to some coding a bit as well um, but I just wanted to have this discussion first because it's important that we um, 
I want to get the buy-in from as many people as possible so that what we actually do makes sense long term. Any other questions on that, Laurie, before I move on? Any other uh, examples you can think of that would need to be covered? My tea finished. So. The main issue is getting it all inverted, yes, but that takes time. But thinking about what we're doing up ahead is always a good idea. Not only because we know what we've got to do, but also um, we can go through the various issues that we're likely to face. I mean, there's lots of code out there I've seen. It's not like a completely bare field. Uh, I feel comfortable about it because there are already examples of most of these bits and bobs out there. Um, one thing that there isn't yet that I've seen is an FMC to wishbone or that kind of stuff. We're, we're going to have to work that one out. I don't know what the easiest one on that front is to do first, but... Um, you know, you can do that. The thing I'm more worried about on Amalgam, by the way, is writing the synthesis for the um, DDR, DDR RAM. That's more of a nightmare for me personally. I find some, need to find some help on that front because I'm just, it's not, not, my, not my expertise. Current implementations are in lots of different languages, often in my gen. Yeah, that's true. I'd have to adapt probably the my gen one first. I'm guessing that would be the quickest way. Or I say I or somebody that already understands that. What what what's what memory controllers does uh, SaxonSoft use? Has it got its own? Or, and what does it support? Implementing Verilog, MyGen, NMyGen, Spinal HDL is a lot of work. Well, yes. It's not, this isn't a one-person job. Different people will have to take on different parts of this, depending on what their expertise and what their need for having it is, of course. The Saxon SOC is mainly just SD-RAM and VRAM. Yeah, the SD-RAM won't be much use to us, right? Because we're not putting ST RAM on this, so that will be a problem. Uh, so I'm just from oh, ULX3 has ST RAM, right? From memory, doesn't have DDR, yeah. So that will need something. I'm surprised someone hasn't written something for a DDR yet. Do people not use Saxon Sock much? I know they use the Litex stuff a lot. I mean, is the Saxon Sock like a really small community or something? Oh, Saxon Sock has DDR as well. So there's something there. Um, do you know if it supports DDR2 as well as DDR3?
that would you know, have to have a look at that. I mean, there are differences between two and three. Yeah. It's more likely to be DDR3 than DDR2. Um, so that, yeah, I mean, it would need changes. Again, um, this isn't my area of expertise. Um, we'd really want to get someone else involved that has experience of doing the memory parts because having some expertise in that is really, really handy. So the DDR3 is mainly tested on the RT7, i.e. people using Saxon sock on the R RT7, RTA7, is it A7? Yeah. I think I've got one of those somewhere, I can't remember where it is. Is it the A7 I've got? Or did I have a different one? I had a one eye RT board, I don't really use it much though. Okay, any, any other matters that are relevant to this before we jump into some code? Oh, a bit tired today. Been a long one, a well, long couple of days actually. Okay, let's move on to some code then. I guess we should review where we were first. Let me just switch the um, display over. Let's get rid of this. We don't need that here at the moment. Um, what do we need? We need, we need this. So, where did we leave it last time? Um, I think last time we on the last session we'd done the get USB CDC receiving and transmitting all we we're doing is just returning it weren't we and any lowercase letters we were converting to uppercase and that was working with putty and then we tried to do the interrupt thing and we fell smack on our asses. Yeah, but I managed to get that working thanks to you pointing me to that um, other example. I can't remember what it's called now. That gave me the clues I needed to um, get it working. So I could put, let, let's probably just um, step through some of that code, I guess because it's now working obviously interrupt based m labs example that was it thank you i've subsequently found some others as well um lorry that's quite interesting but anyhow um let's have a look at the code so the prob one of the problems that we were having oh i remember now it's coming back to me the issues for coming back to me. Uh, so one of the things that we had a problem with was we were trying to access the USB device in main, uh, in, in main, he said, wait a minute, what's this? There, in main. And oh, I've deleted all that code now. At the same time, we needed to access the polling parts in the interrupt, which is down here. So the issue that we had was it didn't like the way that we were kind of sharing the wrapped USB 
uh, bus and its endpoint memory array that was passed in and it was complaining bitterly when we tried to do the USB polling in the interrupt. That was the issue. And then in the example that we found, um, we kind of got half of it working. We found that the we could share the USB device, but we actually needed the serial wrapper as well. So one of the things that I saw in that other example um, was the common element, which is the USB bus. They wrapped it in this thing called a maybe uninit which is designed for memory that may or may not have been memory or items therein that contain memory that may not yet have been initialized are considered, um, is it UB, is that the terminology? Undefined behavior in Rust. Um, so it wasn't letting us do that. But you can do it this way, but in order, having to get this, getting this work, once I'd rewritten, looking at the, um, the MLabs example, the only way I could get it working was by moving from the Rust stable to Rust nightly, because we are using this maybe uninit in particular, certain features are already supported in stable, but other parts of it are not. And one is the, abol the ability to have a mutable borrow from it, I think, because when we use it here, um, we are using it, we are absolutely we are using two things in there one is this usb bus right usb bus being the maybe uninit wrapper around the usb bus um, whereby what we're passing into that is a mutational reference rather than just a regular uh, mutated thing i think it's because it was actually a mutated reference it didn't like and also this call here uh the assume in it ref both of those features are in nightly but they're not in stable so that was the other um if i look at the commits does it tell me i did actually put this in the commit no no how do i say bloody history on this there was a view, a view, a way of looking at this. Roll back to no show diff, change list. No. Uh, view. No, it's another function, isn't it? Commit. Project. <sighs> It is not obvious to me, damn it. There is a way of looking at this. Oh, what's Laurie saying? The ULX free team seem to be thinking about the next boards. They are also thinking about carrier boards and DDR3 memory. Oh. Can't think where they got the carrier idea from. A faster FPGA chips, possibly from Xilinx and Altera. But they're going to rely on um, either the proprietary tools then, because does I don't think the is the um, is Project X Ray 
operating yet in a way that it can be used with the Xilinx stuff. I'm pretty sure the Altera stuff isn't yet supported. Have you heard anything on that or know anything about that? Um, Laurie, because I haven't I haven't seen any announcements or any changes recently. They have never been open source only. Oh, I see what you're saying, right? So they're not that bothered about that. Okay. Um, mm, that is interesting. It's good that they're working on new stuff though. So um, basically I need nightly to run this example, but it does now run. So the other thing I've done here is, um, let me just explain the way I've structured this. Again, because it's no good just sharing the USB device, you have to share the serial port wrapper as well. Um, so Again, I got this idea from the way that the M Labs people have done, and I've seen it elsewhere as well, or variations. So what I'm doing is I'm creating a structure here that contains both the serial port and the USB device that are in turn wrapping the USB bus, right? Um, and then what you can do is you can add uh, in Rust, you add you can add implementation or methods if you like, if you want to be thinking about it from a kind of a class point of view to that strut. So um, this is the implementation of the um, behavior of that on that strut. Uh, this is the setup. So in other words, to create one of those structures. Um, or at least get it operational, initialize it. So the first thing we do is we get hold of that uh, you know, maybe an init wrapper. Um, including the memory here. So we're setting up that USB bus with the memory. Um, and we are writing or modifying this maybe an init to reflect that with the new bus. And then um, We're getting a local mutable reference to that. Sorry, not mutable. The local reference to that, as well as the serial. And these are, sorry, and a device. These correspond to these parts of the structure, serial and device. So we're effectively loading those. We're connecting those with these. And then we're doing our USB setup. But this has changed just slightly. There's a couple of extra bits that we've put in here. Um, can't remember what it was. Serial number we didn't have before. And self-powered. Um, we then create the USB serial device. Um, and effectively, we, we do that in a critical section. And we also unmask the interrupt that we're going to use, which is the OTG FS. And that, that's pretty much the same as we were doing before. That OTG FS label is shared down here on the interrupt name. So it knows which interrupt this belongs to. Okay. Um, that's the implementation of the uh, structure, the setup of the structure. Then we have a get, uh, which enables us to get hold of this item here, which which it wraps in an option. I've talked about that before. So USB serial as a mutation, uh, mutable. Um, and then again, we have the pole. So this is a modification of that polling 
uh, functionality here which enables us to actually go and check we call into the USB device and we see if there's any actions pending and there can be a number of different events that are pending inside the USB device so internally if you go off and look at the USB device that we're calling upon here it goes and looks at a register an event register and it picks out four or five different bits of that register uh, to see whether there's like a reset a power up event a suspend or a reconnect event or it's just a data event whereby there's been some sort of reception of data for example or transmission of data um, so in this case um, we go and grab our USB device we poll it to see if there's anything going on that also handles by the way if it needs to clear any of those interrupt registers it clears those I believe on the data example when we start reading the data then it does actually clear itself automatically but on the others you need to clear that but that's actually done in the USB device code itself so we create a little buffer this is the same as it was before for the non interrupt one by the way uh, and then we do this serial read from the USB and then basically we're copying everything in the buffer but any any of the lowercase letters here we're converting to uppercase we're just modifying that butter buffer and then um, what we're doing is we're writing that stuff back to the transmission endpoint if you like of the USB device with the modified version of this um, and it can do that in chunks that's why we have this right offset might not do it all in one go and this pole is being called by the interrupt so it's now whereas we had that in the main loop it was being called every time round, which is daft so that means that you're calling the pole even when nothing may have happened on the USB you know there might not even be anything connected so uh, having it on the interrupt here means it only goes and checks for polling um, if a event has happened that's caused an interrupt in the USB device it's much more efficient um, so now the main code does everything it did before um, Again, this is the same as we had before where we're setting up the type of interrupt uh, for the buttons and nodes and then the clocks is the same we haven't changed anything with that the GPIO port we haven't changed the USB description um, setup for the pins etc is the same that's no different um, the only thing we're doing here is we're calling upon it statically to create this new singleton US the device um, and structure and set it up um, and then the loop went back to what we had before because we now have no USB stuff in that loop we just had the uh, the uh, button and the um, the button semaphore detection and the changing of the LEDs so that's just reviewing where we are with that really again it's still a little bit complicated I think when we move on to the framework stuff this will look a bit simpler because we can get rid of some of the boilerplate stuff I could probably just run that actually. Wouldn't hurt. Uh, although I need to get the ATG up first. Bear with me. Let's get a power shell. Let me just find the relevant. Um, Open OCD up. Let's try running this. Oh, 
Okay, you can hear the um, USB being powered up. Now I just continue. And then we have the USB connected. Now if I run putty, should be able to connect that. Any luck. I think it was COM10, wasn't it? Let me just turn the putty window on so you can see what's going on here, guys. And I need to change the size because it's bloody tiny. I wish I could change this so it changes permanently. Not an expert on putty. Let's up the size and the alias. Change the font to something nice and large. Apply. This better we can actually see it now. So now if I type in here, so normal letters are just copied, so dot, comma, that kind of stuff, and numbers, what do you want to, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. But when we want to do something like, hello, I haven't got a caps lock on, but hey, presto, look what's happening. It is changing to uppercase. I can't do lowercase. It's not possible. So it's doing what it should do, but now it's being um, interrupted. So we now have our CDC operating, you know, receiving and uh, sending. I mean, obviously, this is really just a loop back of a little modification of lowercase letters to uppercase, showing that the entire thing is working around, which is kind of cool. Right. So let me get rid of that for the moment. Right. Just quit that. And Laurie says his is working as well. I did upload the changes. Uh, let me open the um, repository so that we can see what's going on. Actually, why is that there? That's very strange. Hold on. I'll just keep that like that for the moment, but I wonder if I've lost. I lost some tabs. Okay, uh, let me just get the repository up anyhow. GitHub. Uh, that crab. Let me just show you so that you can see the browser. That would be helpful. So yeah, you can see here, um, huh. Oh, I actually did it on Friday and Saturday. When did we stream? Was it Friday? Maybe the fix was, maybe the interrupt fix was done on Saturday. In fact, I think it was. Can I see this one? How do we get to that? Damn it. I thought you could do it from here. No? <sighs> Annoying. Uh, code. Commits. There we go. 
converted CDC example to the interrupt driven one. Yeah, this is the one. Kill. So what was the second one? Is must have forgotten something here. What did I do? Ah, oh, yeah, it's just updating the to-do list. Good, 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 good. Um, one thing that I did think that we could start having a look at then. So let's get rid of the browser. We don't need that now. Um, is look at adding in. I hope I haven't lost those tabs. Damn it, I'm going to have to look for those in a bit. Adding in the... Um, support for SPI programming of the FPGA. I think that was what I was thinking of. Now that's going to be board specific, obviously, depending on the pinouts. Um, but we might be able to try it on the um, the ice board, the ice core. So I'd need the first thing I need is to do the um, ports. So I will need to just briefly go back to the browser because what we need is the pinouts. For the ice core. Um, so let's just go up to here and look at ice core CAD. In fact, is it here? Circuit. Hmm. Oh, George. Damn it. Oh, I hate it. I really wish it had a better way of looking at PDFs, but there we go. Is it a PDF or a PNG? I can't remember. Let's just open this locally then. It's the easiest. So the pins we are interested in are the SPI pins. Let's just check one here, actually. So we've got um serial select SCK MISO Mozzie reset done. Oh it's a bit complicated isn't it because we need WP and hold as well. Mm, this is gonna be joyous. Uh so let's see what we've got here. Oh, crikey. There's our SCK, Misi, Mozo, sorry, Miso and Muzzy. Um, and then where are the other pins? They're probably on the other side, aren't they? Done. Hold and WP. So those are on the PC, on the C, port C, and these are on port B. That's good, because we've got P, B open. So we need, uh, we need PB3, 4, and 5, right? PB3, 4, and 5. Where is it? Not SS. Did I miss that? Is it on this side? Yeah, it's nice on PB, is it? Great. So, um, 
we need four, five, and six. And let's just go back to our logic here. So it goes SCK, Miso, and Mozzie. Let me just get that out of your way. So the pins here, we're going to need push pulls, I guess. I mean, no, we're going to need an alternate function here. Or were we going to bit bang this? We're going to use SPI, weren't we? Oh, we can't. Damn it. Sorry, folks. We have to bit bang this because on the way that it's wired on the ice core is the SPI flash is connected to the same pins and i had a choice i either use the spi to write to the flash or to the fpga so i think i chose to write to the flash um so if i want to repro write to the fpga i think i have to bit bang it i better check that um again if i look at the code so I'll bring the browser back. We better double check which way round that is. It's very important to get it right, otherwise this will not work. Um, let's just sorry folks. We go to here and we go ice core and I need to look at the firmware oh I need to switch to the CDC <clears throat> my storm and if we look at uh, my storm .cpp, I think Hold on. Yeah, I heard Laurie saying I think you need to bit bang it. Um, I seem to remember it's that way. Let's look at FPGA CP. I think this is the one that does the business. So we obviously need to bit bang the reset pin and CS pin is definitely bit banged. Uh, C down is obviously an input. Um, FPGA config, FPGA right. Here we go. So when we do a right here, yes, look, I'm using these right pins here. And I'm writing on the clock. The MISO pin and the SCK, so I need to bit bang those three. Yes, slight complication. That won't be the case on the amalgam board. I'm not making that same mistake twice. That was a real pain. Uh, let's get rid of the browser. Okay, let's go back. So here we need. Um, these are push pull outputs, so let's just copy that. Um, let's have them below this bit, not to confuse these. Um, so we're going to have uh, what was the order? SCK. And that was PB3. Um, then we had 
MISO PB4 and then we had Mozzie which was PB5 right yeah Whilst we're here, I may as well do the others as well. So the others we needed, we needed a reset, SS and done. So let's just do these as well. These are different ports, but. Uh, SS, uh, reset, and C done. All done. And done will be an input, so that'd be the same as the button here. Be like a floating input rather than a push pull output. Um, we need another one of these because these are on port. Well, SS is on a different port. To the other two. <sighs> Hold on. Oh, come on, come on, don't do this to me, machine. Oh, bring my window back, please. I can't see anymore. Right, so. Damn it, I did it again. So you can't see this because it's off screen, but I, I did take a shot of the um, PDF. Oh, I just can't quite get to the um, part of the drawing that I need. Right, so C done is PC8. Eight. Um, this should be DPNIB C. It should be D. And that should be B, and that should be C. <laughs> Reset is PC thirteen. No, yeah, PC thirteen. And DPIOD is PD two, I think, can it? PD2. So that's right. Why is this not sniping this? Hold on. Keeping IO should be capital C here. Right. Uh, IO C. There we go. That's looking right now. So we've now got all of our pins. Um,
Okay. Bear me a sec. I'm just going to refill my glass. Back again, folks. I need some more water. Um, right, so we've got our pins. Okay, cool. She's in and out like a yo yo. Are you back, Twinkles? Meow. Yeah. You should finish off your food that I put out. Oh, left the door open, look. Um, I'm just wondering if maybe these would be better in a structure. Meow. Should we put them in a structure? So what I'm thinking is something like we've done here. So we have a, you know, a, a spy. FPGA spy even. Are you wanting attention, Twinkle? Is that what you are? Do you actually want to go out somewhere or do something? Hmm? Well? Um, in which case, we could have uh, buttons. like this maybe um. oops Meow. Uh, 
FPGA, FPGA, spy. And we need some curly brackets for this. So we can have a setup function, right? Just like we have above. Um, that would set these pins up. Um, thus. You'd have to pass in, I think. What would we have to pass in? Well, we have to pass in the pins, or would we have to pass in the ports? If we pass in the ports, because they're not going to be modified here. Um, if this was generic, I worked for other boards as well, then we might not want to pass the boards in. Sorry, the ports, because they would differ. This, is bit, this would be application specific. If I was passing in here, you know, GPIO B, GPIO D, and GPIO C, I would have to know which pins those were. It wouldn't be a very generic thing. And those might be on different ports on a different board. And yes, thank you. I've forgotten the WP hold. WP and hold pins. Oh, Twinkle, what can I do for you? Hmm? I don't know what you want, apart from attention. That's very specific, but then should I pass in the pins? Can I pass in the pins? Is that possible? With references? What happens if I do that? Does that make more sense? Hold on, what do we do with the USB here? We grab it because it's a communal thing and then we build it. You're not really passing in anything from the peripheral at this point. Oh, one minute. Yeah, maybe we leave that as an external thing. So in other words, what we'd be passing in here would be... <sighs> um, SP... I... Oh! Dear Twinkles, how can we help you? Hmm? You just have to have some attention, or what? This would be, uh, sorry, SCK. Let me say, Mozzie. Um, this is going to be quite long. Do we need reset? And done. Um. 
let's assume we don't for a second. Actually, I wonder if this is going to work. Um, let's do this. this. It's what an issue with this. Oh, are you giving up now? Then, because when you get back there, go back. Um, I think that's all we need for those. I need to provide types as well. Damn. Um. Oh, types. Mm. This is a bit weird, isn't it? It's like output push pull. Are the types individual? Output push pull. Output push pull. I think it is. I think that's what these are. Does that work or does it complain? Uh, what's it objecting to? It doesn't know what that is. Build output is already declared. Huh? Uh, oh, bloody hell. Now, what's it complaining about? Field push pull is already declared. Push pull. Mm. Hold on. Do I need to bring these in? My IDE knows what they are. Expected colon got. Is that not what you do? Hold on, I'm mixing myself up here. Is it the extra 
Do I not need that, maybe? Hmm. Unresolved output. Have I just brought that in? Hold on. Where did it bring it in from? How? Maybe. It might be right. And then if I import that one as well. Push pull. Am I good now? I think I am. That should. I think it's happy with that now. Um, <coughs> didn't like my naming, but tough. Do I want that across here? Oh, oh there is some extra um brackets I don't need here. Silly me. Um crikey. Should I be passing them all in like this? Changing ownership. This program doesn't need to own these. Right, I tell you what I'm going to do. So this is daft. I'm going to do. I'm going to cheat. This won't be generic for other boards right now, but I can change this afterwards. Uh, that parts. Parts. I'm going to make this specific. So what we're going to do is we're going to reproduce all of this here. Take it out of here. P. I'm going to put it in here. It's probably going to complain like buggery anyway. Just sort this out. I'm going to pass in P, which is peripheral, I think. Peripheral. Hold on. Peripherals. Mm. Oh, 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 which one is it? It's not cortex. <laughs> we can hear that cat again. Is it the peripherals of the STM32 HAL? Maybe. I think it might be. Except I've already split this here. Can I do that in two cases? 
Ooh, this is could be a bit tricky. That might cause a problem. Let's put it in for the moment. I just want to see if it will actually let me compile this. So that would set up the pins. What happens if I try and compile this? Should we have a look? Oh. Uh, set up and hold. Uh, sorry, hold and WP. So hold is PC11. That's only two of these. PC11. And 12, I think it is. Uh, 11 and... Twelve. Hold is eleven. WP is twelve. And WP. And the other thing is. All of this is wrong. Oh, uh, forgotten how to do comma select. That would be handy here. Let's go back to that. No, no. Damn it. Is that right? Should I be manipulating those directly like that? Should I not be using a self reference here? I need to create a new object struct, one of these. So, no, it's not going to work. So, what I <laughs> okay, right. I'm being a bit daft here. So I then need to create uh, one of these. With this. Uh, let's do them all in order. SS WP and hold. Oh, 
So setup will effectively return that. Normally, how it works, I think. Does it have to return that? Uh -huh. Okay, I've forgotten. Or do I have to create it? Um, when we do this, we don't need to because it refers to the external one. So it's like a static call. But in this case, this would return one. Wonder what happens if I try and compile. It's a good way to find out. So let's see what it has to say about my mistaken code. There's a lot for it not to like. Expected function found struck. PGSPA main s one one nine. Expected function found struck. Oh, I haven't said what it's going to return, have I? I'm not even sure if returning the struct is a good idea at this point. Maybe I don't need to do that. Damn, I've forgotten. Hold on. Let me just check something. I don't think it likes me returning a struct. Or self. Uh, uh, normally I do have to have this, don't I? Hmm. 
do I actually need to do this? Or do I just set them? I think this should be like that. Sorry, no, this should be. Oh, damn. My keyboard's gone back to the wrong language. I think those should be set off actually. Hold on. Why does it not let me select? It's not let me do it. Come on. Hold oh, no, on one second. If I select in column mode, mm, very annoying. Right, let's do it manually. We do that. doesn't like that. Add self to function. Oh, what am I doing? Of course, yes. So why doesn't it like that then? Cannot assign the field of immutable binding. Make self immutable. Ah, aha. Why 
why doesn't it like that then? Mismatch type. Expected output push pull found. PB3 output push pull. Oh, this is that weirdness. Oh. Good point. Um, Laurie, curly brackets. Let's just take this back to what it was. I don't think this is going to work because it's not mutational. I don't think it's going to work. I think um, I might be looking at this fan the wrong way. Help me struck literal syntax. Oh, do I have to actually specify all that as well? I thought there was a shortcut way of doing this. I still think I'm going to come unstuck because there's something wacky about the type. Oops, uh, what is that nozzle? Wacky about what's returned from these calls here. It's not actually returning out, but push pull. It's actually returning a pin which is of its own type. That's going to get me into trouble. Maybe I want to be doing something slightly different this is going to turn into one of those fun ones where I find out how little I know about Rust's type system and handling that's what's the problem here this is yeah it's saying mismatch type Because what it's saying is what gets returned here, so for SCK, what this returns isn't output push pull, it's it actually returns something a type called PB3, which contains output, which in turn contains push pull. And then this one returns something called PB4 type, which includes the same things. They're like their own individual types. Ah. I'm doing something slightly um, odd. So yeah, I will have solved this problem, but unfortunately the um, I have a type problem. Yeah, it doesn't like them, see. Expected struck output found struck PD2. You see, the each individual pin has its own type. That is one of the weirdness factors 
of um, the way that Rust is handling these I.O. pins. Hmm. Oh, dearie, dearie. So doing this in a struct might not be the best way of doing things. Hi, the hoody who. That would mean that this structure couldn't be the same structure if another chip is using different pins. I need something more generic. And see, you just coerce it into the lower type, but that's not going to work here. Um, I mean, what you could have is you could wrap each one in a sum, but that seems daft. Maybe I'm thinking about this wrong. Maybe this isn't very, there isn't a, a rust. It, what, what is idiomatic rust? <laughs> it's not rustonic. It's not um, rust-like. Um, Let me have a little cheat. Let's have a look at what is done. What happens with the spy in the howl? Oh, they have something generic called pins. That's interesting these be called pins? Where does pins come from? Where the hell do they get pins from? Can I do that? <clears throat> what happens if I do that then? Uh, let's just try changing the type of these to pins. Will that work? Hold on. There yeah, has to be an easy way of doing this. Oh, uh, where's my... Capital P? No, I don't think it is. Um. Okay, I'll undo that. I messed up here. It's a bit overzealous. Let's do that. So what happens then if I use pins as a type? I'm intrigued. I'll probably complain because I don't have pins. I've not complained so far.
simply can't find pins, so why isn't it telling me that here? It should be complaining here that it can't see pins, but it's not. Where do pins come from? Pins come from... Prelude, maybe? Have a look. Prelude. Oops. Prelude. Uh, where does it get pins from then? Hold on. It doesn't like that I haven't got pins as a type. Oh. Wait, no, it's not doing that. <laughs> oh no, 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 no. Sorry, I'm looking at an example in there how library, of the way they pass pins around. And it's actually a tuple called pins. So a new SPI instance, you have to pass pins in, but what it does is it passes in spy. Hold on. Let me look at the um, spy. Struct spy. Struct spy is a generic struct. Composed of an SPI interface, by the looks of it, pins P, Interesting. Right. Okay, so they they're using much more advanced um, methods. They're using generic types to define their SPI struct. Their SPI struct looks like this. Hold on, let me just show you. What they do is they do this. What the hell is that doing? So I do that. That's weird. What the hell? 
Have I got my column thing turned on again? Yeah, I'm going to turn that off. Right. Um, so this is the way that they're defining in, inside the HAL, they define a struct like this. And what that basically says, it's a bit more generic. So it's saying that SPI is made up of um, something that implements interface pin and state. These are interfaces. So it is describing things that hold the things. This is one of the more abstract parts of um, Rust, which is quite interesting. So rather than defining what pins are, what it's saying is the thing called SBI needs to implement uh, the interface I. Okay, or implementation I. And the pins things each need to implement uh, the interface P or implementation P and the state needs to implement the state. So they're not saying what type the pin is here. They're saying what it must implement. This is something that Rust can do, which is very clever. So the way that you'd get around this is you'd say that these would need to implement. I'd need to do something just like this, right? I'd need to do, you know, FPGA spy. Like that, fundamentally. And pins would be actually be a tuple, I think. For which does a pins behaviour? So if I did that. Oh, I don't have an interface. Let's just remove this part for the moment. I mean, I do need to do this actually, because I do need to add effectively what is read and write bytes. Um, so this is actually a good structure. Oh yeah, I want it to be camel case. Okay, fair enough. Um, okay. Right, this changes things, doesn't it? But do the names mean anything? Crikey, that's where it gets. Yeah, they break it down a lot more. Holy crap, that's a lot deeper. It's actually quite good looking at it though, what they've done. Very well structured, but it's more generic. I'd almost want to inherit that behavior. I don't know if you can do that. Oh my word. Right. Um, hmm. You can't see what I'm looking at here. It might be a good idea to be able to see that. Let me just change windows for a sec. It's probably totally confused the situation, but you can actually see what's going on here. I mean, what they're doing may be slightly overkill, but let's just, so that you can see what's going on. Let me just change. Oh. 
Let me just change the one there. So now, yeah, let me show you it. So if we look, so I'm looking inside the actual HAL itself in the way it describes the pins or, or the various things. So I'm looking at the library, the way that the HAL library uh, manages its, what it calls its SPI struct. So here's the struct which I just showed you where I copied and paste. So what this is saying, it has the, um, this is the instance interface plus the enable interface by the looks of it. Uh, and this, the P is the pins interface and the pin itself holds an I instance <laughs> deep man and state i don't know what state is here but that's kind of weird so if we look at then the implementation for struct what it says here this is state disabled i don't quite know where that is it says so for a new creation of a new um oh look this is what you return you return self very clever yeah so the new function returns self which is the structure so spi it sets to instance which is a combination of i and pins what Pins P I hmm. instance I pins P S P I equals instance pins it doesn't set pins to P does it? That's a bit confusing. So what is it doing? Setting state to disabled. What is it doing with pins? not setting pins at all is it okay not setting pins but there must be pins Okay, I'm going to have to do some more homework to get this finished. I need to look at the way that they're doing stuff. Replicate as much of that or use what they've already got. Kind of running out of time now. Um, yeah, what is the time? So I've been streaming for... Hmm. Oh, quite a long time actually. Didn't realise. Nearly three hours. Holy moly. Let's just continue looking through this a little bit more and then I'll finish up in a few minutes. We're not going to get this done today, obviously. I need to do a bit more homework. Um, I wonder if I can reuse the SPI function, actually. So if I look at a use of SPI, right, in their library, their example. Hello, Twinkle, are you back? You've been outside. Very good. Right, so here what they're doing is initialize SPI, right? So they're creating a new struct here, and they're calling the static new implementation. And what are they passing in? They're passing in instance P SPI 13. Sorry, SPI 3. 
I don't know where they're getting that from. That's a static part of P, peripherals, I guess. Interesting. Okay, and then the pins they're passing in, that is a tuple of pins that have been set up. in the normal way but with alternate modes in this case hello so in alternate modes they're not returning what's the type that this returns hmm. variable variable gpio unknown. I don't know where GPIC is. It's there. Oh, that's because it's picking it up. It's not seeing the class, the ID is. So. It's just not being able to second guess what this type is. But I'm guessing it will be its own type and its own pin. So I think the type for SCK is probably going to be different from this just in the same way that we have but it's passing them in as a tuple okay passes it in as a tuple so if we go back On new, see an instant plus pins type P, but it doesn't seem to do anything. Is it automated or something? Why it copies everything in between? Is there like an automated, is it a shorthand, syntactical shorthand? So is it taking pins because it's got the same name, it doesn't need to do that? I bet you it's something like that. But it's actually assigning pins. This is assigning a tuple. So pins in this case actually contains a tuple of pins with which is basically a collection of instances. Mm. Deep, man, that's deep. Okay, so if we enable, what I want to look at is, so when it enables this, sets the clock up. Then it sets the phase and polarity. Of course, it doesn't have to implement any manual pin bit banging or anything, so we won't see it actually doing any of that. DMAs. It's the fact that we're bit banging, so we can't just use an SPI peripheral like this. <clears throat> Hmm. So a spy example is probably a bad one. I probably need some collection of GPIOs. I don't know if there is such a thing. <clears throat> I'm going to have to be a bit more clever. I'm going to have to have a think about this. I'm going to leave it there for the moment. So what I'm going to have to do is, because they're different types, I have to use their behavior implementation in the structure if I'm going to put it into a struct. Anyhow, that will do for now. Uh, leave this one with me and we'll come back to this. Thanks for joining me again, folks. And... Um, I'll see how I get on. I might do a stream on Friday or something if I make some progress on this.
but if not, it'll be next uh, Wednesday. So thanks for joining me this evening, and I will speak to you soon. Cheers. Ciao.